I will work day in and day out to wake up and smell the coffee. We want to return to the European Union. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. In this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by David Skelton, author of the book Little Platoons, and also author of the forthcoming book, The New Snobbery. Welcome to the podcast, David. Hi, Will. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's great to have you on. Now, the first thing um, that I'd like to discuss is the first book that I mentioned there, uh, Little Platoons. Um, Could you just um, describe to the um, listeners what the book is about and and how you came to write it? Yeah, um, so obviously Little Platoons is the the famous Edmund Burke quote about conservatism, Mm. about those little platoons, the, the, the strong communities. And I wanted to write a book about my hometown of concert and lots of little places like that and big places like that, which were dominated by industry, by steelworking in concerts case, or by coal mining or by potteries, etc. places that were dominated by heavy industry for a long time, but then the industry closed and the towns were forgotten about. And I I just wanted to talk about how those places went from places that were, had huge amounts of pride in work, pride in their place. Concert was really proud of being the place that produced the steel that that made the British Nicholas submarines, Mm. that made the Sydney Harbour Bridge, that made the Blackpool Tower. And the the, the football club is still called the steel, the the, the nickname of the football club is still the the, the steelman. the, the, the steel club is in the middle of town, so everything is based on what was produced. And the argument of the book is that a lot of these places where you had a lot of skilled work that people were proud of mm-hmm. has been replaced by a lot of unskilled work, mm-hmm. and those places were forgotten and ignored. This book came out in well before the realignment elections. It was just after the Brexit referendum. Mm-hmm. And I argued that Brexit was a, was a cry that these places had enough of being ignored. And the argument was that if a political party really focused on their concerns, then they could realign the political map, which is actually what happened in 2019. And obviously a lot has happened since then. But I still think the the focus still needs to be on places that have been forgotten about, have been ignored for too long. Because one, from a basic perspective that a a well-functioning country cannot ignore places and people mm-hmm. and the re- Brexit referendum was largely result, uh, a partial result of people rebelling against an economic model which hadn't served them and hadn't worked for them and too, t- too much time is spent thinking about aggregate thinking about numbers like overall GDP as opposed to thinking is my town growing mm. uh, or are our places being left behind and forgotten about so there's that. And also, I think an overall national economy is obviously not functioning the best it can if, if, if towns and villages and cities are being forgotten, forgotten about and left behind economically. Mm. Uh, and there's also the political thing. The, the, I, I, I said there was a potential for a lasting realignment in politics. Mm. To that. And I think that focus needs to be redoubled, that there are places and towns that have felt forgotten about and the important thing is that a focus needs to be placed on them. And I slightly worry the focus has gone away from them since the 2019 election. And I think it needs to return to that. So the thing about the little platoons was, it was remembering all these communities around, around the country that they've been forgotten about and how you need a, a, a bold strategy and an industrial strategy and an economic strategy to make sure that every place and every person is making the most of their potential. Mm-hmm, absolutely, and um, I mean, you um, mentioned there, and, and you mention it in the the book about the um, proud history uh, of concert and the um, importance of the steel industry to the town and, and to the you know um, industries to the entire region. Do you think that during the shift away, as as those industries were taken out of um, towns and villages and areas? there was a failure to understand from the people who made the decisions that, you know, these um, industries or um, these particular types of professions were quote unquote unprofitable. Do you think that there was a failure to realize for the people who made those decisions, how important the industries were 
to the not not just the economic identity of these areas, but also the social identity that there were entire towns and communities that had basically been founded and grown around these these industries, and there was a, a failure to understand the scale of the social impact that would happen when they died off or, or, or were removed. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one the social cohesion point that the the these industries. You had a lot of towns which which were called mono industrial towns. They were they were focused on one industry, mm-hmm. um, and when they closed, people ignored the social impact that would have. And I, I talked about this from a traditional conservative angle, that the, there are things which are more important than pure liberal economics for most conservative for most traditional conservatives. The the importance of community, the importance of family, the importance of a feeling of solidarity. And and when you had a wave of mass unemployment in certain towns and certain cities, then that obviously impacted things like community, obviously impacted things like social cohesion. And I will still argue to this day that industries, rather than being done away with, could have been, been modernized. If you look at what happened in Germany and South Korea with, with a proper intelligent industrial strategy, in, industries could have been made to to compete in the modern age as opposed to being closed completely. Um, and, but that needed a kind of intelligent industrial strategy. And I, I fear what happened in the 60s and 70s in particular gave industrial strategy a bad name. Whereas if you look what what's happened in Taiwan and South Korea, particularly, and in the Asian Tigers, a, a proper market-facing industrial strategy has worked. And in terms of social cohesion, um, Norman Tebbett, who is, is certainly not what you call some bleeding heart lefty? Um, he said he said that the scale of the pit closures, for example, went too far. The, the, we didn't think about enough work for people. We didn't think about the social problems that were coming in its wake. Um, so, so, so I think that's really important. The, the social issues, the importance of social cohesion, and the importance of pride of place. Mm. Um, there, the, there were the. There are one, one or more, more than one or two places around the country where the the name of a town, the focus of a town, the the identity of a town, is still revolves on industries that closed several decades ago, and that's because nothing as substantial enough has sprung up in its place. And I think the important thing now is that how do we create a reindustrialization after decades of deindustrialization? How do we ensure that places with a proud engineering and a proud skills skills heritage have high skilled, high paid jobs that not only make sure people don't want to leave, but also make sure people want to come back and have jobs that people can be proud of and industries that, that a town can build an identity around now as opposed to an identity of something that closed several decades ago. Yeah, absolutely. Um in in terms of the vote, obviously this book was written um just after the um twenty sixteen vote, the twenty sixteen referendum how much do you think the reasoning behind um why people voted to leave was to do with a feeling of um unhappiness with the european union and how much do you feel it was unhappiness with what they felt that the european union represented uh which was you know sort of a seemingly um powerful remote um, arbiter of um, their lives that had not, you know, helped them. That seemed to be more of a burden through various EU yeah. regulations. How, how much do you think it was specifically against the EU as an institution? How much just what it represented in terms of like a a, a broader um, idea, you know, in, intertwined with feelings of, of remoteness of Westminster as well? Yeah, um, I, I think that's a really good question. The the first point, there was obviously deep unhappiness with the way the European Union worked. Mm. The, the, the fact of it, as Tony Benn famously said, we were being governed in many ways by people we didn't elect and couldn't remove. So the, the, that democratic point, um, uh, the, the remoteness point, the bureaucratic point, but also I think the fact the European Union seemed to represent a system that wasn't working for people. Um, and th- this was part of an economic model that has been going, going back for decades that didn't that wasn't seen as delivering economic gains or economic benefits. And I think there was an argument for Brexit, which 
that Brexit would give us the levers to pursue a proper industrial policy, which I fear we, we haven't done because too many people have kind of thought about the the, the kind of ultra liberal approach to Brexit as opposed to the more intelligent use of the state and being freed, freed for example, from state aid rules. Mm. Um, but I, I think that there was part of the economic model people were revolting against, part of the remoteness, and just it was the first opportunity that many people had to really, really, really make a point at the ballot box because so many people had their votes taken for granted for so long in places like concert, which 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 was um, Labour Party pretty much going back to to the Labour Party's formation. A lot of people's votes were taken for granted for too long, and all of a sudden mm. this opportunity came along to let the, let the establishment, let the status quo know that people weren't happy with with the status quo, weren't happy with being ignored. Um, so it was almost a kind of primal scream of anguish to say, stop ignoring us, stop paying attention to the real economic needs and the real social needs we have. And that happened in, 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 the, in the few days after the referendum. You kind of had busloads of journalists going to places like Concert and Barnsley and, and, and doing doing lots of kind of interviews on the street. Mm. And then all of a sudden they forgot about it again. Mm. But you you quickly had people paying attention to what was called left behind voters. Um, and so to an extent that worked in terms of drawing attention to those people in those places. I, and I think also the realignment flowed from that as well. So yeah, I, I, I don't think, I don't think there was one reason that people to vote, vote for Brexit, mm -hmm. but being given a reason to protest against the fact the the status quo wasn't working for them. And when when, when George Osborne launched um, the Remain campaign in Goldman Sachs and talked about not not blowing GDP growth, and I, I remember speaking to plenty of members in my family who basically said, "Well, it's not growing around here. We we haven't seen any any of any of this prosperity." And and the fact that prosperity and growth wasn't being shared. And we didn't have an economic system that, that, that was creating the kind of high skilled industrial jobs that people could be proud of, that paid well, that, that, that really gave a sense of pride and identity to towns. So I think that was a really important part of the debate as well. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about um, the election that uh, occurred a year before the, the 2015 general election, how much do you think of the Conservatives being able to uh, gain a majority at that election, going from a, a coalition governing with the Liberal Democrats to, to governing on their own, was related to that commitment to hold an EU referendum? Because you, as I mean, as you, as you rightly point out, a, a lot of the um, you know reason that. Um, People voted for uh, for leave in in 2016 was this feeling of you know a lack of prosperity that uh, things hadn't been um, working for them. So I'm just wondering, what do you think um, was the was behind how the Conservatives managed to win the the 2015 referendum despite having governed for a, a period of five years and a lot of people still feeling that you know that things hadn't changed for them. They hadn't uh, seen any increase in prosperity or, or any great change. Yeah, I, I think the offer of a European referendum was obviously important for party management reasons. You, you remember very early on in that Parliament, there was a there was a massive Conservative rebellion mm. uh, on on a, a vote for a referendum. So I, I think that was important, but also I I think it was crucial in terms of getting the Conservatives over the line in in, in a few constituencies where UKIP is a big challenger, for example. Mm. Um, I think there were probably other important factors at play. The yeah. the with potential of an SNP Labour coalition, for example, the fact that Ed Miliband wasn't seen as a suitable prime minister, and the fact that for many of the the seats were, that were at play, that what was called the long term economic plan back mm -hmm. then was was seen as actually bearing fruit. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there were several issues, but I think the promise of the referendum, what was important in enough constituencies to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, in ju just going back to the the, the 2016 um, referendum for a moment. Um, the Labour Party's uh, role in the Remain campaign was obviously quite um, muted. Um, it seems clear, looking back, that um, Jeremy Corbyn certainly was not an enthusiastic um, Remainer, even during the campaign, certainly hadn't been beforehand. How much of the Labour Party do you think in 2016 and, and going forwards was 
split in terms of the recognition of what the referendum meant. Because there were obviously some Labour MPs who saw that the result of the referendum meant that they you know, had to uh, commit to ensuring that Britain left the European Union, whereas there were other parts of the Labour Party which very much wanted a second referendum and, and wanted to um, you know, try and either have a chance at joining the European Union or trying to um, ensure that the, the 2016 vote didn't go through. How much of a, a, a split do you think that was and how deeply do you think it's felt now? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting point. Um, and I think a lot of it is about the changing nature of the Labour Party and the changing mm. nature of Labour's membership. It, it, it became increasingly not a working class party, not represent, in terms of its membership base, not representing the kind of voters who voted for Brexit in, in, in the um, left behind places in the post industrial former, former Labour heartland. And more was a kind of representative of particularly into the Corbyn years of, of, of a kind of middle class identity politics obsessed um, movement. The, the Corbyn thing is interesting because obviously I mean, Corbyn had rebelled against every European treaty. Um, mm. he, he was very much with the campaign group Benites on Europe. Um, and I think he made clear he was at best reluctant to be enthusiastic about Europe dur during the referendum. Mm. Uh, but I think the the gulf between the membership and the MPs and traditional Labour voters was made pretty clear during the referendum and abundantly clear afterwards. Um, in the in the gap between the twenty seventeen and the twenty nineteen election, when people in the northeast and people in Yorkshire made very clear that they'd made their decision, they'd made their will clear, um, and they 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 wanted their decision to be implemented. And what they heard back from their representatives in the Labour Party after the second referendum won the argument internally was that, no, you got it wrong the first time. Why didn't you have another go? Mm. Um, so that kind of bleeds into the kind of new snobbery argument that you had an increasingly middle class Labour Party that didn't really respect the, the traditional working class vote and, and, and basically, basically said, no, you're wrong. Go and try again. Uh, and you... It was astonishing the level of anger from people in my family, people in concerts, people across the Northeast I spoke to, who were like, why can't they hear us? Why, 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 why are they making us try and vote again? It was seen as really quite arrogant. And for me, it was, it was really symbolic of the changing nature of the Labour Party from a working class party to a middle class party. Mm. And you, you mentioned um, new snobbery there, and I think that would be uh, a good point to transition on to discussing the, the forthcoming book. Um, what, what made you want to write uh, The New Snobbery and how do you think things have changed since you wrote Little Platoons to, to writing The New Snobbery? Yeah, it was partially the, the reaction to both the um, referendum result and the 2019 election result that traditionally after you've had democratic events, people have said, we disagree but your view is entirely legitimate. Um, we will go on and kind of fight the next election. But what I heard after the referendum was plenty of people say, why are what, why are they detect, dictating our future? Mm. There was very, very much a, a belief and a feeling amongst kind of a, a, lot, a lot of middle class progressives and some, some people, frankly, on the Remain wing of the Tory party who were basically saying that some people weren't legitimate political actors. And, and some of the commentary you saw after the referendum and after the election talked about people being ignorant, talked about people being stupid, talked about people being not 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 in not not fully versed with the facts. Hmm. And that that struck me as a new version of snobbery. Traditionally, when we'll talk about snobbery, it's almost comic, it's guys hmm. highest K and Captain Mannering and this kind of thing. So it's not knowing whether to say loo or toilet. It's not having kind of basic manners and this kind of this kind of thing. But the new snobbery I thought was more more damaging because it it, it hit it late, the legitimacy of people to be actors in a democracy. Mm -hmm. When you have basically had people saying your view is less legitimate than mine, be, be because you're ignorant about Europe, because you're racist, because you're stupid, and all of these things going through. 
and a lot of a lot of these people on the progressive left wouldn't like to think of themselves as snobs, but snobbery is what it was being displayed. They 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 were basically saying that that people's views weren't legitimate because it was less educated, etc. And then you looked into other elements of life. You looked at the fact the cultural life is dominated by people from relatively well off backgrounds, where whereas in the kind of sixties and seventies it was a very much a working class class pursuit. And you you look mm. at the hollowing out of the economy. You look you look at the fact that, as I say, political parties are much more middle class, much more distant from working class Britain. And you you can you can see this kind of base of snobbery that even even drips in the comedy programs like the news quiz. Mm. Uh, taking the mick out of working class people. Um, and I, I thought it was important to write a book about it because they were basically people saying people like my family and my friends in places like concert weren't legitimate political actors and, and they were using, they were punching down at them. And I, I thought that needed to be recorded and, and written about. Mm, absolutely. Do, do you think that the um, motivation behind this kind of new snobbery is in part... A, it's kind of like a, almost like a, a, a comfort blanket for, for some people that if they create this image of people that they are, you know, as you say, um, either stupid or they don't know um, what they're talking about, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they won't have to engage with them in the same way that they would someone who they consider to be a um, reasonable political actor and therefore might have to confront, you know, views or opinions, or, or the popularity of certain views or uh, opinions that they might find distasteful, that it's a way for certain people in um, progressive circles to have a kind of like comfort blanket, a, a barrier between them and, and, and other groups, so they don't have to um, realise that perhaps, you know, some of the things that they believe aren't necessarily that popular with a lot of people, or that, you know, they don't have the kind of electoral support that they might otherwise think. It's, it's, it's an excuse not to engage in the argument. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it's basically, it, it's the old kind of philosopher king concept that because you, you have so much more information that w- 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 why, why should you why should you change things because a bunch of people who don't have the information uh, want to change things. Obviously that's nonsense. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I would argue that the, the elite, for want of a better phrase, have been wrong about so many issues in the past 30 years. They were wrong about the Iraq War. They were wrong about the RM. They 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 were wrong about the run of the banking crisis, and the people in so many the people who have been decried as being ignorant have actually have actually been a a head of elite opinion in so many ways, and and I think you, it, it's not just in progressive circles. We all, we also saw all with the kind of with the forty nine day experiment in in ultra neoliberal economics earlier this year. Mm. Uh, be, because political parties have been hollowed out, you, you have basically have a few dogmatic people who don't understand that a vast majority of the British public don't want dogmatic neoliberalism. They don't want dogmatic socialism either. They will want things which are going to make their lives better. And and I think when you have political parties that are increasing the middle class and increasingly estranged from a lot of the public, then you're going to get these issues. And 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 something I talk about in the book is is that the Labour Party and the Tory party used to be genuine mass movements, not the kind of mass middle class movement that Momentum was, but Labour Party used to represent working people through trade unions, but trade unions have been, uh, their membership is no longer what it was. Um, the, the Conservative Party used to be a massive social party as well, and that's gone as well. So you, you get the kind of middle class hollowing out of political parties, you, you don't have working class voices in culture anymore. Um, you don't have the opportunities uh, because you don't have the same kind of vocational system that, say, Germany and North, Northern Europe do. So, so you have a, a holding out, a lack of a working class voice in major elements of, of the country. Um, and then you also have this level of disdain. And it goes with what people like Michael Sandel have talked about in, in terms of the obsession with merit. That when, when you have what is called a meritocracy, which frankly most prime ministers going all the way back to, to Margaret Thatcher have talked about. A lot of the people who've succeeded think that, that there is a downside of this. A lot of people who succeeded think they've only done so on their own merit, and the people who haven't risen up the ladder have done so because of a lack of merit. Despite the fact in most places, a lot of people choose not to climb up a kind of corporate ladder, hmm. or I, they haven't had the opportunities. But this concept of meritocracy has also been an interesting kind of pernicious impact as well. 
Mm -hmm. Do you think that then, um, and you you mentioned meritocracy there, do you think that perhaps the way that, you know, we should view these kinds of things isn't through a lens simply of a particular type of achievement that with the expansion of university um, education, we've often overlooked the importance of, you know, um, paths either through education or, or, or through training that don't involve university. And as a result, yep. we've had a negative impact on, you know, the economy because things have obviously, you know, people haven't um, necessarily been getting the kind of like um, training in particular um, um, skills or, or professions that the otherwise would have done and though this has also had a, a negative impact um, socially as well because you know the sign of going to university because so many people um, do now is, is seen as as you say as a, as, as a sign purely of um, merit and not going to university is seen as a sign of not merit rather than viewing them as two um, perfectly legitimate routes of um, you know getting an education and then progressing in life. I, th I think that's true I think there's three elements to it the first is a problem of social stratification um, David Brooks has written about this in America, the, the kind of the Bobos and par Paradise concept that a, a lot of people who kind of went to university and end up basically kind of ju just getting engaged with other people who've been to university and then you have kind of progressive circles and don't tend to mix with people from other, from other backgrounds, which mm -hmm. is why a lot of people were very surprised by the by the Brexit result and by the 2019 result because they, 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 they tended not to mix with people from outside their background and outside their circle. The, the, the second point is, is an economic point that if we're not having a system that enables people to have the kind of really important industrial skills and technical skills that the economy needs, then the economy suffers if, if we're just kind of pumping out lots of, lot, lots of graduate degrees that the economy doesn't need. Mm. And the third thing is a, is a human capital point as well, which is in places like Germany and Northern Europe, having a vocational degree or an apprenticeship is absolutely on a par with, 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 with having a degree. And that really helps towns and cities to kind of build up a strong economy. It, it helps people from a relatively young age to really become experts and, and be regarded an, ab an absolute parity with people who've been to university. And several members of Angela Merkel's ca cabinet, for example, had vocational qualifications. And what I think is important is, for a long time, vocational education has been invoked to talk about, but it's always been invoked for someone else's children. I, I, I think we need to have it on a par. So someone who's been to Oxford would be happy sending their, their or, and works in professional jobs, would be as happy for their kid to go to a major vocational establishment as they would to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Mm. I think that is when parity will have been achieved. And if, if you look at where the challenges come in terms of the economy, if you if you look at the Inflation Reduction Act in America, if you look at Made in China 2025, and all these other big industrial challenges we're facing, the truth is the skills we're going to need to compete in the global economy will often come from, from, from vocational training and apprenticeships and not mm. necessarily from universities. So in terms of competition and as an economy, we have to pivot back to vocational and skill and apprenticeship. Mm-hmm. Um, now, uh, during the podcast, we've obviously discussed two very important uh, moments in recent um, British politics, the 2016 referendum and the 2019 general election. Of course, um, Boris Johnson was very much involved in both of those. And he's been in the news, of course, quite a lot recently with um, standing down as a, a member of parliament. What impact do you think his leaving parliament, at least for the moment, and, and no longer be leader of the Conservative Party will have on the next election and on those voters that he encouraged to switch from Labour to the Conservatives. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting point. Uh, I remember shortly after the Hartlepool by-election, when it looked like the realignment was being strengthened, I, I, I said that the 2019 election had turned Brexit voters into Boris voters and the challenge was to turn them into Tory voters. Hmm. Um, obviously, that's now trickier. <laughs> Um, but I think when a realignment starts happening and seats start getting competitive, that is important. And I think there's a fundamental point that if the Tories want to win the next election, there is only one realistic route, and that is the 2019 electoral coalition. And they have to focus absolutely all of, the, all of their energies in keeping this back, keeping this together. 
and making sure that people who vote Victoria for the first time in 2019, often against kind of decades or, or, or of kind of family history going back to the minor strike and mm. beyond, um, they need to see improvements, they need to see a vision, and they need to see Conservatives speaking directly to them and, and really focusing on the need to build a strong industrial economy in places that really need it. Um, and let's not pretend it's not going to be a challenge for the Tories next time around. But the only route to victory is through those real line seats through the 2019 electoral coalition. So the focus really has to be on that and really, really putting rocket boosters under levelling up. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you um, for taking the time for speaking to me, David. It, it's been fascinating to, to chat to you um, about both of the books. If people would like to purchase either Little Platoons or the new Snobbery, where should they go? Uh, to purchase them and um, if people want to find out more about you where should they go to, to find out more about you yeah um, they, they can obviously go to all good booksellers but if they drop me a line on a direct message on Twitter I'm very happy to sign send a um, signed copy uh, my, my my Twitter handle is at DJ Skeleton um, so please do, please do get in touch that way uh, I, I'd love to hear any feedback any thoughts it's been a real pleasure doing this and I think the issues that, that have been addressed about the importance of people having good, high-skilled jobs and, and places that people could be proud of living in is the most important thing for us today, but both in terms of um, having having vibrant towns and also in terms of having a vibrant, competitive economy that mm -hmm. is as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast or commenting on an episode that you've listened to, you can do so at thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.